We always want the sunshine, but he knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer, but our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. So whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Inspirations. All praises due to Allah. We praise Him. We seek His aid and we ask for His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evils of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can lead astray. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, none can guide. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone who has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is His servant and His messenger. Welcome dear viewers to a new episode of Inspirations. The show in which we travel through time, we travel through the annals of history to join our great Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We try to spend some time with him and with his companions. We try to learn from the mind of wisdom and beauty and good character so that inshallah we come back to our time equipped with all the tools that we need to make it inshallah to paradise to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can always write to us on our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. Again, our email address is inspirations at huda.tv. Do write to us. Let us know what you think about the show, what suggestions, what comments you have. You're, you're always welcome, inshallah, to send uh, your, your comments and your suggestions. And we will try to benefit from them, inshallah. Uh, last time we said that the Prophet ﷺ and the companions, after winning the battle of Al Khaybar, and after managing to subdue the Jewish tribes that had been plotting against the Muslims, had been plotting to annihilate and destroy the Muslims forever. After the Muslims have overcome this enemy, and the enemy was supposed to be expelled out of the Arabian Peninsula, yet they came up with an option, with a suggestion. The Prophet ﷺ took it seriously. We said he was an open-minded person. So he took that seriously and he decided to leave the Jewish tribes in the area of Khaybar. They cultivate it, they look after it, they water it, and they grow the crops and they take half of the shares or the produce and the Muslims take half. The land has become the Muslims. It has become the property of the Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was open-minded when he dealt with that situation and he was always open to new suggestions, new options, and he was somehow flexible without compromising the principles of Islam and the principles of his understanding of the status of the Muslims and their relationship with others. Now, the, we said uh, last time that there were some transactions after the battle taking place. For example, one of the companions, his name was Fudala ibn Ubaid, he had some transactions. For example, he bought some gold from other people in the land of Khaybar. And this gold, it was a necklace, and it was, the gold wa, uh, was mixed with other uh, elements, with uh, other ingredients as well. So in order to sell that gold, uh, the gold, the gold has to be, had to be melted down. So you purify and you separate the gold from other, other things, so that you can weigh it up and get the right weight of it, and then sell it for what it, what it really uh, worth. So Fudala did that. But he asked the Prophet ﷺ about the possibility of uh, not or selling the gold uh, on installments so that he won't get the price in cash but he would get it as installments. The Prophet ﷺ told him when it comes to silver and gold, you have to weigh it up and you have to pay the price immediately. Why? The Prophet ﷺ, this is something called in Islam, Saddu Dharai'ah. Uh, it, calls, uh, it can be translated into precaution measures. We take precautions not to allow any possibility 
for people to delve into riba, into usury or usury, which means basically to exploit people's needs, especially the poor people's needs. So the rich take advantage of the needs of the poor and they exploit that need so that they uh, impose upon them interest, which is called interest, but actually it's harm, we said, it's usury or usury. So the Prophet ﷺ cut all the means, all the possible routes that could lead to that usury. One of them was selling gold and silver uh, on, on, on a longer term uh, kind of transaction. So you uh, sell them and the person pays, in, or pays back in installments. This is not allowed in Islam. Why? Because it's just on the borders between proper transaction and usury. So the Prophet ﷺ put an end to that. So we see that the Prophet ﷺ even though he was involved in battles, in military action, and he was teaching his companions, and he was handling the different affairs of the Muslim Ummah, he was still very careful about how he instructed his Ummah, his followers, to hold on to the Islamic principles in everything. And we said previously that the Islamic Sharia was sent down to mankind in order to bring them benefit, in order to make life a pleasant experience for them on this, on this earth, in this world. Uh, the Sharia is not meant to confine you. It's not meant to make life harder for you. On the contrary, yes, some legislations could be felt or could be perceived as hard, as difficult to abide by, but this is only on the short term. And in reality, ultimately, they will lead to a greater ease. Actually, ease could never be achieved except by following the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's just that humans are very hasty, humans are short-sighted, they don't really appreciate the depth of the sharia, the depth of the Islamic law, the beauty of it, that really gives everyone their rights. And Islam tries to bring justice to everyone. And it's the only system that is capable of bringing, bringing justice to, the, uh, to, to all of humanity in its entirety. Other systems like capitalism, communism, whatever you know, system it is, it will definitely uh, bring injustice to people. Any human endeavor to bring justice in that sense will be deficient. Because human beings have limited senses. We have a limit, limited intellect. And what is applicable to one time is not applicable to other times. But with Islam, it is the legislation of the Creator of the heavens and the earth. Our Creator, who knows the present, who knows the future, who knows the past, who knows what will set things right in this world. His knowledge has encompassed everything. So He's the one who sent us the system that will bring justice to everyone, the rich and the poor, the weak and the strong, males and females, everybody will get their rights. And even the Prophet ﷺ, or the Islamic, he told us about times that will come when a person will, will get the zakah that he's supposed to pay. The money he's supposed to give in charity as an obligation, the, oblig the obligatory zakah. The time will come when the Muslim will carry the zakah that he's supposed to pay and he will search for poor people and he won't find any poor people to take it. So he'll return back home unable to give it. Not, not, e not even able to find someone who is needed to take it. Why is this? This is because the zakah will be applied. Islamic system will be applied. So will be no, there will be no poor people. Capitalism will never sort out the problem of poverty. On the contrary, its very basis, its very foundation is about creating the separation between the rich and the poor so the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's the philosophy behind it. And ultimately, this is what it leads to. And it's been around for a long time. And what did it bring about? It brought about so many recessions, so much injustice. Even in the United States, so many, about 50 million people live under the poverty line, which they call it under the bread line. Where is capitalism with all the great promises and the, and the, the flashy slogan, slogans? They can never bring justice to humanity. It's only Islam, the system of Allah that was designed and made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us. And the time actually came during the, the, the Khilafah of the later, after, uh, during the Umayyad period. The Muslim historians have recorded that at some times the, 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 uh, the people who used to distri distribute the zakah, the, the workers in Baytul Mal, they used to go around in the, in the Muslim uh, empire, which stretched, uh, which stretched at that time from the borders of China 
to Spain. They were searching for people, for poor people to give them the, the zakah. And they didn't find poor people to give them the zakah. Everyone was well off. Everybody had their needs answered and they even had surplus money. Why did that happen? Because of applying the Islamic system. Because of applying Sharia, which many people don't really realize its beauty. And we Muslims hold the responsible and responsible partly for that wrong image that we have propagated with our lack of commitment to this wonderful system, the divine system of Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ, despite the time of war, he was teaching his companions. His own companions were so keen to learn about everything they did, whether it was permissible or impermissible. Was it okay? Is there, was there any harm? And they won't hesitate to follow the system on the advice of the Prophet ﷺ. This is why they excelled. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them dominance over the earth. Because they held on to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The whole world was subdued to them. The whole world became at their service. It yielded itself to them. Because they abided by the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why don't we do it today, Muslims? In this miserable state in which we live, we always complain about everybody apart from ourselves. We complain about the conditions. We complain about the enemies. We complain about our leaders. We complain about our scholars. We complain about general people. But we don't complain about ourselves. We don't really check ourselves uh, rightly. And we don't try to correct ourselves. And that's the secret to success. We have to be mainly focused, mainly concerned about ourselves. How can I rectify my situation? How I can rectify my character? How can I really hold on to the deen of Islam, to the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ? No matter what, even if people don't want to hold on to it, I'm responsible for myself. And I will be responsible before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let me be even the only person who holds on to the truth in the world. Let me be that person. Make it a challenge and we can change. That's the spirit that the companions possessed and this is why they excelled and this is they, why they, 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 they carved the names in, 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 the, in the mountains of history, in the annals of, in, in the chronicles of history. These were our ancestors, this great generation. So the Prophet ﷺ was always teaching them and teaching them the wisdoms behind these great uh, instructions behind this great system of Islam. Uh, now the question comes after the Muslims have overcome the Jewish tribes there, what did the Muslims get as spoils of war? Mainly there was no silver, no silver, no gold. Abu Huraira, one of the Muslims who witnessed that battle, he says, we did not take as spoils of war, we did not get, uh, we did not find gold and silver. The, our shares were basically food. They were cattle, sheep, cows, and they were pieces of land, gardens, of fruitful trees. That was, this was the, 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 the type of spoils that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them from, uh, the, uh, from the land of Khaybar. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the Muslims after this battle. And actually Umar ibn Khattab himself says, he says that we did not reach, or we, we did not fill our stomachs in the history of Islam until we, we conquered Khaybar. So throughout these years, about six years, the Muslims were living in what? In poverty. He says we've never had our, stomach, our stomachs full except when we conquered Khaybar. Now these Muslims living all these years in poverty, yet displaying the highest and finest levels of character and beauty, how did they do that? There was no crime in Medina, there was no theft, there were no prisons. It was a wonderful society, it was an ideal society. How did they get that? Although the, 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 he says we've never had our stomachs full, we never reached that feeling of being full until we conquered Khaybar. So how were the Muslims, you know, uh, uh, having these battles and winning the wars and uh, being patient even with, with the, the prisoners of war? How did they, you know, fight on every front? How did they handle the different challenges they had to deal with? How did they do all of this? 
while living in a state of hunger. How did they do that? It's Islam. It's Islam. Today we, we complain about the, the level of, of morality, the level of character in the Muslim lands. We, we complain about that. It has, is, it, it has really uh, deterior, deteriorated. And we feel bad about lack of honesty, lack of truthfulness, lack of commitment. Everywhere you go in the Muslim land, you know, you're very prone to be you know, set up. Why? Why is the case so? Many people say it's about poverty. People are hungry. Well, the Muslims were even more hungry than that. The Muslims were even poorer than that at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Yet, they were the best in terms of manners on earth at that time. Why don't we follow the same example? Poverty is not an excuse. Yes, poverty is a difficult experience. It's a very harmful experience. But only when we decide to make it and to, uh, uh, to make it overcome our morality, it will affect us. But if we, do, if we decide not to do that, we will be able to. The companions made that wonderful achievement. Why can't we do it today? So Umar al-Khattab says, we've never had our stomachs full except when we conquered Khaybar. And guess what? How, what, did they, what did they fill their stomachs with? Do you think it was uh, m- meat, lamb and chicken, etc.? No. He said, we filled our stomachs with dates. That was it. Even dates. So that was one of the best days. That they have really you know, had enough food and it was dates. Mainly dates. You see what kind of state they were living in? Yet they were the best of people at that time. We'll learn more about these beautiful examples, inshallah, after we, we come back after the short break, so stay tuned. Allah knows what's best for us, so why should we complain? Oh. Inshallah, on the straight path, we would like to discuss the niqab from an Islamic and social political perspective. Mm-hmm. So sometimes some non-Muslims they might not understand the full Islamic pictures. Anyone can say anything about it. Yes. So when can we? Who speaks for Islam? Mm-hmm. This is the biggest question. Yes. <laughs> who speaks for Islam? Mm-hmm. No, they are not sinning. They are not sinning. But we are talking about now the general rule. Mm-hmm. They are not sinning, but they are going against what has been established it is his own ishtihad at a specific time people would see it as a um, threat a threat exactly mm-hmm. how do we how do we explain to them it's not really a threat it's, it's actually good for the country as well but if we don't participate how would we ever reach to our rights can you clarify with us what should be the level of political participation of the muslims in the west yeah. oh. What's best for us? So why should we complain? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. As usual, I remind you to write to us. So if you have any comments, any suggestions, anything you'd like to share with us, you can write to us on our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. Our email address again is inspirations at huda.tv. Now the Prophet ﷺ and the companions were displaying the highest level of, of manners, of, of character at that time, despite the fact that they weren't rich and most of the time they didn't have food to fill their stomachs. Actually, Aisha tells us that even for about three months, they didn't cook any food in the houses of the Prophet ﷺ. And when she was asked, what type of food, or oh, how did you live, how did you survive? She said, well, we only had two things, water and dates. Water and dates, they survived on that for months. That was the best and the greatest among humanity, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So it's not food that makes us great. It's not food that makes our life uh, wonderful. It's not uh, food that makes us successful, but it's high aspirations. It's having a wonderful dream. It's having vision about the reality and the meaning of your existence. And only then, will be able to transform ourselves and, and ultimately transform the whole world to make it a better one for everyone, inshaAllah. 
and this should be the dream of every Muslim. So the uh, the the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam split and distributed the the shares of war to his companions. Uh, Abu Huraira tells us that the Prophet sallallahu used to give one share to artillery fighters, the ones who were on their uh, feet, the on foot fighters. As to the fighters who had their horses with them, he gave them three shares. Why? Because those people, mainly, uh, they were exposed to more danger. Another thing, uh, a horse was very expensive at that time. So this meant that this person took part in the battle, in the way, in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by means of jeopardizing his own life and he, even his own wealth. And that was, it was worth it. And actually they could cause more damage to the enemy. So this is why a fighter with a horse uh, received three shares, but uh, one fighter on foot, he received uh, one share. And actually some of the, uh, female, uh, the females among the companions received as well. There was one of the, uh, of the woman companions, Sahla bint Asim. She was with the army, helping out, obviously. Um, she was given a share as well. And she had a daughter as well that was born. Uh, at that time, and the Prophet ﷺ gave her a share, gave, gave to the little baby a share as well. So we see that even women are appreciated at these times and are given uh, their rights. There was one servant, one of the servants of the Prophet ﷺ. His name was Mud'im or Mud'am. This Mud'im, he was one of the servants of the Prophet ﷺ. And he made a mistake. Before the shares were spread, there was a piece of cloth, a nice piece of cloth. Without anyone observing, he took it and put it in his, uh, put it in his pocket or, or hid it somewhere. He hid it somewhere. It wasn't his right. These were the spoils before being distributed. He took that to himself without anyone noticing. Now that is called al-ghalul or al-ghulul. In the, in the Islamic terminology, in the Islamic fiqh. And this was a mistake from this companion. But what did happen to that person? Inshallah, later on we'll come to talk about this. Because later on we'll get back to him and see what happened to him because of that action. So the Prophet ﷺ was, is about to leave Khaybar now, the land of Khaybar. But look at the, the, the spirit of leadership. The Prophet ﷺ now, we have conquered this new land and he's about to appoint a leader there. And this is, there's a benefit here we can take. Once you build a project, once you reach an achievement, and you plan to move forward, and once you move forward, you won't have enough time to look after that stage or that project, appoint someone, a deputy, to look after it on your behalf. That is one of the elements of success. If you are, it's called stewardship. If you are able to achieve a certain level or make a business reach a certain level or an endeavor or a da'wah effort to reach a certain level and you plan to take a turn or to move to a new area, don't leave that area dead. Don't let it die out. Give it, entrust, entrust it with, someone, with someone else that you, that you teach and train in order to, be, to qualify to take care of that and then leave it with him. That was clearly understood by the Prophet ﷺ. So uh, one of the people of Banu Adi, from the Ansar, from the people of Medina, the Prophet ﷺ appointed him as the Amir of Khaybar. So he looks after it, he runs the affairs there, because there were Jewish tribes there. So he was supposed to be the Amir, the leader, to make sure, and obviously, uh, definitely there were some Muslims living there, uh, who moved to live there, because they were given shares as lands. So he was to become the Amir, the Prophet ﷺ entrusted him with that, and this is one of the beautiful aspects of the leadership of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now there was one companion. After, the, after Khaybar, he had a plan. Something, you know, some thoughts were running through his mind. And he had a deep insight. What does this companion do? He goes to Mecca. And he speaks bad about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why would a companion do something like that? Why would a companion leave the army of the Prophet Sallallahu the victorious army in Khaybar? Why would he leave that uh, land and that victory and go back to Mecca? Not to Medina, to Mecca, where the Mushrikeen are there. 
and he goes and he gives wrong news about the Prophet ﷺ and he speaks bad about the Prophet ﷺ and about the Muslims in a negative manner. Why does he do that? Now this companion has a very interesting story. His name is Al-Hajjaj ibn Ilat. Al-Hajjaj ibn Ilat. He, after the battle of Khaybar, he goes to the Prophet ﷺ and he tells him, O Messenger of Allah, I've left behind in Mecca because he, made, he had made uh, uh, hijrah. So he says, I left in Mecca my family and I left a lot of property, wealth, money, uh, my, my gold and silver, my savings, my life savings are there. And it seems that his wife did not accept Islam. So he made hijrah by himself and he left his wife, but still he, all his wealth was, his, was with his wife. Or it seems sometimes from the story that he did not announce his Islam. So nobody really knew whether he was Muslim or not, especially in Mecca. So he says to the Prophet ﷺ, I have wealth there, I have my savings in Mecca, I want to get them. I won't be able to go there and get them unless I spread some wrong news about you. And I have to speak negatively about you and about the Muslims. Can I do that? The Prophet ﷺ told him, do that. So he goes to Mecca. Why? Because he needs to take his share and his own wealth and he won't be able unless he makes that. So he goes to Mecca and he goes to his wife and he tells her, get me everything ready, all my wealth ready, all my gold and silver ready. She says, why? She's suspicious. He tells her, Muhammad has lost the battle of Khaybar. They have been destroyed and all their wealth, all their land is, uh, is offered for sale for a very cheap price. So I'm going to buy as much as possible from these chairs. It's a, it's, a, it's a good bargain. It's a very good opportunity. She gives him all the wealth, all the money. And he spreads the, the, new, the news spreads around in Mecca. So the kuffar become very happy. Uh, Abu Sufyan and others, they're very happy that the Muslims have lost and they, they thought that the Muslims were destroyed and that was the end of Islam and the end of Muhammad. Al-Abbas the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ gets depressed and he sends one of his slaves to Al-Hajjaj and he tells him what, you know, what type of news you're bringing because he says Allah promised the Prophet ﷺ to give him victory and I mean it doesn't make sense this news doesn't make sense so Al-Hajjaj says to this slave go to Al-Abbas and tell him don't worry things are just as you like but I'm here to take my wealth I won't be able to do that so that's the only way for me. And he tell him that I will come back and see him. Anyway, he takes his money, his wealth. The slave goes to Al-Abbas and he tells Al-Abbas, he conveys the message to Al-Abbas. Al-Abbas kisses the slave on his forehead and he says, go, you are free. <laughs> you are free. Because the news is so, uh, is so beautiful and unexpected. Then uh, Al-Hajjaj walks around in Mecca and he sees the Muslims who, who were there, who couldn't make, migrate to Medina, felt depressed. The people of Quraysh are so happy, they rejoiced at that, at this news. They thought, that's the end of Muhammad, that's the end of Islam, the end of Muslims. Now, we're relieved. But Al-Abbas, uh, Al-Hajjaj walks around in Mecca, and he sees that state. Then, he's, he goes to Al-Abbas, and he tells him, Muhammad has won the battle of Khaybar, and Allah has given him so much wealth, and Allah has given so much wealth to the Muslims and they have become so powerful. But I'm, I just said that because I need to take my money because I could foresee that these people of Quraysh will not let me take my money and I don't want to lose it. And it's my, it's my right. So I came to take it. But he said to him, keep that news for yourself for three days. When three days have passed, go around in Mecca and spread that news. I would have been gone. Al-Habbas was very happy. Al-Hajjaj ibn Ilad goes back to Medina. All his wealth is with him and all of his money is with him. Uh, three, days, three days later, Al-Abbas is walking around in Mecca and the people of Quraysh are so happy and they're trying to make fun of him. They said, well, how is your uh, nephew doing? Talking about the Prophet ﷺ. How is your nephew doing? We had, then they, they tried, they said, well, should, maybe we should console you. Maybe we should just feel a little bit with you. We're sorry for that news that you received, for the news you received. He looked at them and smiled. He said, no, the news is so great. 
Muhammad has won, has overcome the Jewish tribes of Khaybar, and he has won so much wealth, and the Muslims are well off now, and things are just in, completely in their favor. Now the people of Mecca were just shocked, and they, they tried to sniff around, tried to find out the news, they realized it was true, Muhammad was actually had won the war. So they were depressed. So all the depression that the Muslims suffered from in Mecca, these weak Muslims turned into happiness, and the happiness of the disbelievers turned into depression. And it was a disaster for the people of Mecca to receive that news. And Abbas told them, Ilad, or Hajjaj ibn Ilad came with this news just because he knew that you won't let him take his money. So he wanted to take his savings, and that was the only way for him. So the people of Mecca, all of Mecca was in a state of depression after that, except for Abbas and the Muslims, who really rejoiced after receiving this wonderful uh, news. Now this story is narrated by Anas ibn Malik. He tells the story of Hajjaj ibn Hilat. Now the Prophet ﷺ is about to leave Khaybar, and uh, he is heading towards Medina, but before heading to Medina, he goes to another place, and inshallah we will talk about it. But before that, on the way, as they were leaving Khaybar, the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ and the companions were, uh, were, uh, I mean, were marching out of Khaybar towards a place called Wadi Al-Qura. Now, on the way, they were walking all, all night until they became very tired. And about probably two hours before Fajr, a little while before Fajr, the Prophet ﷺ tells the companions to camp and to sleep, take some sleep. Then he tells Bilal, he says, Ya Bilal, ihfad alayna salat al-fajr. Ya Bilal, you stay awake, so you wake us up for fajr, because we don't want to miss the prayer. Bilal says, okay. So Bilal starts to pray the night prayer. The Muslims are sleeping. He prays a little bit. Then Bilal sits and he leans back on his camel. Why? Because he just wants to take uh, to rest a little bit until Fajr uh, or until dawn comes, falls, and then he calls the Adhan and he wakes up the Muslims to pray. Now Bilal goes into he falls asleep. He falls asleep, and the Muslims uh, miss the Fajr prayer. And the first one to wake up was the Prophet ﷺ and it was after sunrise. So Fajr time had already passed and the Muslims woke up, the Prophet ﷺ woke up to see everybody was sleeping. So he says, Bilal, what happened to you? Bilal wakes up and he was shocked and he says, Oh Messenger of Allah, you know, I was taken but what you were taken by, I was taken by sleep. So he apologizes. So the Prophet ﷺ wakes up the companions, he tells them, Let's go out of this place. So they march out of this place. And then they, uh, after a little while, they stop again. The Prophet ﷺ calls for, uh, for water. He makes wudu and he uh, instructs the companions to call the Adhan. Then he prays Fajr as he did, as if it was on time. So he prays al-Fajr, and that was the incident, the famous incident of the Muslims missing Salat al-Fajr. Obviously, this incident didn't happen one time. They missed the Fajr more than once, especially during this, mainly according this, uh, during this journey. Uh, so what was the feeling of the companions after missing the Fajr prayer? This is something we'll talk about after this short break, so stay with us. Allah knows what's best for us. So why should we complain? Those who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, for those who want to enter the Jannah, the paradise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for the believers, that's why we need to learn and we need to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us so that we submit ourselves to the orders of Allah. This is knowledge that we need to learn. Why we're spending more time to look into the verses and to the meanings of the verses in depth, so that we can get to learn from it what we need ourselves to be steadfast, to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to ponder over the meanings of the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
Allah knows what's best for us, so why should we complain? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. Yes, the Prophet sallallahu and the companions uh, sleep a, a few hours or two hours, probably a little while, a short while before Fajr. And they keep Bilal awake in order to wake them up for Fajr. But Bilal uh, accidentally falls asleep and they miss the Fajr prayer. So the Prophet ﷺ tells them, let's march out of this land. Now the jurists, Muslim jurists, the fuqaha, they have a, a few opinions about this. Why did the Prophet ﷺ tell them to leave that place? Some of them say the Prophet ﷺ was waiting for the sun to rise a bit more because it was the time where, pr where prayer is prohibited, uh, just uh, after sunrise. Uh, but there is a stronger opinion because there is another narration by Abu Hurairah where the Prophet ﷺ says about this area where they slept and they missed the Fajr prayer. لَقَدْ جَمَعْنَا فِي هَذَا الْوَادِ اللَّيْلَةَ شَيْطَانٍ There was shaitan who slept in this area in which we, where we slept. So this is why he caused us to miss the Fajr prayer. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he wanted the companions to leave that place, leave that area where the shaitan slept with them. So this is a stronger opinion because if we collect the narrations that are found in Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari about this, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani makes it clear. He, he seems to support this opinion. It's a stronger opinion that it wasn't about uh, the time where prayer is prohibited because obligatory, you could pray obligatory prayer even at that prohibited time. So the stronger opinion would be the Prophet ﷺ told them to leave that area so he wanted to move to another area. Uh, so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, call, makes them call the Adhan, they call the Adhan again, again. Uh, they call the Adhan there, and he prays Fajr as if it was on time. Now then, they start marching. Some of the companions were whispering to each other, you know, what, you know, will Allah forgive us for missing the prayer? Will Allah forgive us for missing the prayer? The Prophet ﷺ overhears that whispering, and he says to them, am I not a role model for you? I'm your example. I overslept. I overslept. And this actually, it happens. Uh, and I believe, and this is the opinion of the majority of the scholars, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused this incident to happen. So the Muslims learn. And when they miss the prayer, what to do? And that the, if, you, if you are overcome by sleep, you take all the precautions, all the necessary measures to ensure that you will wake up, and you don't wake up, then that you, that you, that there's no harm on you, insha'Allah. There's no sin on you. That was exactly what the Prophet ﷺ and the companions did. They, they let Bilal wait, uh, you know, stay awake in order to wake them up. But Bilal was overcome by sleep. So that, that is why they missed the Fajr prayer. So the Prophet ﷺ tells them, Am I not an example for you? He says, there is no harm in you, over, you know, if you happen to oversleep. But the harm is when a, when a person is just neglects the prayer until the time of the following prayer falls. That, this is where the person, when the person will, will, will be sinning. So the Prophet ﷺ made it uh, clear for them and uh, the, the, the companions learned that lesson. Now this hadith was narrated by Abu Huraira and Qatada and also by, Anas ibn, uh, by Imran ibn Hussein. Uh, now I won't talk about the narration of Umar ibn Hussein because it, it has uh, other elements but uh, it happened another time because uh, the Prophet Sallallahu and this is uh, it ha in another night a few, day, a, few, a few days later the same incident happened but Abu Qatada is the narrator of the hadith so I will keep that until we reach that point now the Prophet Sallallahu marches towards Wadi Al-Qura in Wadi Al-Qura uh, there were uh, some Jewish tribes as well. The Prophet ﷺ goes there. There happens no fights, no uh, no battle, but the Jewish tribes there they they were subdued. They have surrendered to the Prophet ﷺ, and they have accepted the same conditions as the people of Khaybar. Now, when the Prophet ﷺ reached that area, we come back to Mud'im now, the servant of the Prophet ﷺ. Mud'im was. Uh, uh, taking care of the camel of the Prophet ﷺ, he was uh, uh, unloading the camel of the Prophet ﷺ, trying to put the stuff of the, of the Prophet ﷺ on the ground. As he was doing this, an arrow was shot. No one knew where it came from. Was it from Muslims? 
who were training or whatever, no one knows. What was it from some enemy who was hiding? No one knew. But he was shot by that arrow. Mud'im or Mud'am was shot by that arrow or by that spear and he falls dead. He was dead. The companion said, oh, he's a shaheed. The companion said, he's shaheed. Now he was... Uh, you know, bringing down uh, the stuff of the Prophet uh, preparing it for the Prophet And he was shot, and we are in a state of, of war against these people. This is a shaheed. The Prophet says, you don't know. He says, إِنَّ You know the little piece of cloth that he took, that wasn't his, that he took from the spoils of war? It is burning him now. It is set on fire and it's burning him now. You see? Even if you are poor, even if you, you, know, you find it difficult to answer the need of your children and your family, it doesn't mean that you take something that doesn't belong to you. It doesn't give you any excuse, any justification to take some other people's rights. This is what Islam teaches us. Even if you, you have suffered so much poverty and there are, there are people in your country who steal other people's money, who there is so much corruption even among people who have power and authority and they take the rights of the people. You don't have the right to take other people's rights, other people's money. You don't have the right to steal. You don't have the right to become a criminal and to violate other people's rights. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, is teaching them a lesson that the little piece of cloth, the shamla that he took, Straight after the battle of Khaybar, it's burning now. And it's burning him, and he is suffering because of that. So this is a lesson that the companions learned. That no matter what happens, you shouldn't do something wrong. You shouldn't steal. You shouldn't take other people's rights. So, uh, and now the Muslims come back from Wadi Al-Qura, heading back to Medina. And guess what? On the way, the idda, the waiting period of Safiya is over. So the Prophet ﷺ marries her and the marriage is consummated. Uh, when they reach the area called Saddu Sahba, Saddu Sahba between Wadi Al-Qura and Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ consummates his marriage with uh, Safiya and a beautiful social atmosphere there. The Muslims don't have any food, like they don't have, as I said, meat and uh, uh, they don't have uh, whatever, lamb and chicken and all that stuff. We don't have extravagant food. All what they had, the, obviously it's the sunnah, once you have a marriage, is to make a walima, to feed the people. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he married Safiya, he tells the companions, anyone who has food, let him bring it. So they had some uh, little oil and uh, some, uh, some dates, some bread. So the companions, they dug some holes in the ground and they brought... Uh, their, uh, pl- uh, their, their plates or the platters for food they put them in these holes because they were made of, of animal skin by the way treated animal skin and they put this beautiful mixture of dates fat, animal fat and some bread they mixed it together and everybody sat together and they started eating that was the walima the beautiful social atmosphere that the Muslims had during the uh, the marriage of, of the Prophet Sallallahu this beautiful uh, wedding. Now the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before consummating the marriage with Safiya, he gives Safiya to uh, the mother of Anas ibn Malik, to Umm Sulaim, in order to beautify her. So she beautifies her, she combs her hair, and uh, obviously provides her with whatever be- means uh, for beautification. And then uh, she, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, marries her. Now, the Prophet ﷺ looks at the face of Safiya and he sees that she had a black eye. So he asks, asks her about, about, about that. What, you know, what is that on your, on your face? She tells him the story that before the Prophet ﷺ came to Khaybar, she, at night she had a dream when she was sleeping next to her husband, who was the leader of the Jews in Khaybar, one of the leaders. She wakes up, he asks her, what happened? She says, uh, you know, I had a dream. She tells him the dream, she says, I saw the moon falling on my lap. He was a a shrewd person, by the way. He understood 
because he had knowledge about the Jewish faith as well, and he knew had some knowledge about interpreting dreams. He he he, he actually punched her on the eye, on the face. He says, straight away he understood. He says. You want to marry the leader of the Arabs, the chief of the Arabs, talking about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or the leader of Medina? Straight away he understood what the dream was about. She tells him the story. She tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the uh, story. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi with this happy marriage, they march to, uh, back to Medina. It was a very beautiful time. The Muslims are victorious. The Muslims have made a new victory. There's no fear of the people of Mecca after the treaty with the people of Mecca and everything was just in favor of the Muslims. The Muslims was reaching one victory after the other. And this is what, what I talked about previously. The Prophet ﷺ, because he built the right foundations, even during the time of Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ was building the correct foundations. That uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't mainly concerned with urgent matters. He was concerned, to, concerned with important matters that could really build a wonderful success, that could really uh, build the strengths, the, the intrinsic strength of the Muslims, that the Muslims would be build later on, would be able to build on these foundations a wonderful state and wonderful victory. This was exactly what the Prophet ﷺ was doing, and he started to reap the, the fruits of this strategic thinking, of this strategic plan. Now on the way, Salam ibn al-Aqwa, a very intelligent companion, he wants to ask the Prophet ﷺ about his brother, Amr ibn al-Aqwa. But he doesn't ask the question uh, directly. He has a very intelligent way of asking the Prophet. We will try to learn from that beautiful wisdom, so that when we ask our scholars, ask the, ask the teachers, we know the right manner of asking them the questions in order to get the right answer. Inshallah, next time when we meet, we will talk about this. So join us. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah knows what's best for us So why should we complain? We always want the sunshine But He knows there must be rain We always want the laughter And the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong